Hello, good afternoon, and welcome to ACA Festival 2021. This panel is Taking Back Africa's Stolen Treasures, and I have with me Fatumata Ngom, Mazul Diabanza, and Barnaby Phillips. Fatumata is the author of Les Silences du Totem, um, which is um, a novel which is a reflection on art and heritage, and in which the main character works at the Musée du Quai Brownlee, where incidentally, Mazulu, who we will call, has been called a modern day Robin Hood, but I think we should be calling him Andikone, who is a Senegalese, because we, we, we don't necessarily need European references, who goes into museums, including Musée du Quai Branley, to reclaim African artifacts. And we also have Banri Phillips, who wrote Loot, a book on the Benin bronzes and the sacking of the city the capital city of the the Benin people in Nigeria, which came out earlier this year. I will ask each of them to introduce themselves briefly and to state their position on the taking back of Africa's stolen treasures. And then I will read a short excerpt, which is a transcript from a film called You Hide Me that was made in 1970 by a Ghanaian writer director called Kwateni O. So Fatumata, um, please give us your position on taking back Africa's stolen treasures. Hello, so as you said, I'm Fatumata Ngo. My, uh, I'm a Senegalese uh, writer. I write a novel, uh, Le Silence du Totem, uh, which uh, features a young um, uh, Senegalese anthropologist working at the Cape Branly Museum. And also, and while she was doing her work, she uh, discovered a uh, mysterious African totem in a secret part of the reserve of the museums. So this is a very topical um, subject and I was uh, lucky enough to be uh, to contribute uh, to the and also the international debate around the restitution of looted African artifacts, especially after the, the President Macron's speech at uh, Ouagadougou in 2017. And, and yeah, so I am very happy to participate uh, to this uh, art and book festival and to share the virtual floor with all of you guys. I'm very happy to be here and to talk about this important subject and institution. Hello, my name is Barnaby Phillips. I'm a, a journalist and a historian. I was a uh, correspondent for many years all over Africa, including uh, three years in Nigeria. And as Ni nee said, I wrote a book earlier this year called Loot, Britain and the Benin Bronzes, which is, uh, if you like, a political history of the Benin Bronzes, in particular, uh, how my country, uh, Britain, uh, its role uh, in their history. I'm Nia Ikwe Parks, and I'm the moderator today. I am a novelist, poet, editor, broadcaster, a kind of mix of things to do with words. I am originally a scientist by training, and my interest in African treasures is simply because I'm African, and, uh, and treasures have been stolen. So I will read a short excerpt from a film that was made in 1970, as I said. Essentially, Kwateni Owu says that after an all-out attack on African religion, some ceremonies were allowed to continue to preserve an African facade. This is the tactic of destroying a civilization from within, to brainwash Africans into believing that their own civilization is inferior, whilst at the same time insisting on preserving a particular African facade. So his argument is that the looting, of course, some of it was for just wealth, but some of it was very consciously to create within Africans a sense of inferiority and to steal from them some of their heritage and their past and their traditions and their professional capabilities. What are your positions on this, Fatumata, if I could start with you? I completely agree that uh, there were a kind of uh, agenda, not only to loot and to steal physical uh, artifacts, but also to kind of erase what we can call uh, ancient beliefs, because what we call uh, indigenous people uh, before the 
the, the penetration of um, the same religion, such as uh, Christianism or Islam, they had their own. And so the law of the strongest has, um, over a very long period of time, uh, amputated the continent, African continent, not only of its people and also natural resources, physical resources, but also uh, kind of erase uh, the, the super uh, structure uh, by uh, looting and stealing, burning artifacts, totems, and symbols of each uh, culture. So the restitution of uh, African looted artifacts is kind of an urgent uh, need to uh, repair and rebalance this injustice. So it is really a way to bring back the looted artifacts not only the physical, but also a kind of symbolism that is today still uh, live uh, in uh, art in African uh, population. Ben, salutations fraternelles, euh, patriotiques à toutes et à tous. Je suis Moazoulou Diabanza, euh, porte-parole internationale de l'organisation panafricaine Unité, Dignité, Courage, une organisation euh, qui a vu le jour en 2014 et qui euh, lutte justement pour euh, la libération de notre mère patrie Afrique de toute forme et de domination. Et nous avons considéré que la restitution de notre patrimoine rentre dans le cadre de cette libération qui permettra notamment à l'Afrique de reconstruire son édifice culturel. Raison pourquoi, euh, depuis euh, juin 2020, nous avons décidé de rentrer dans une phase qui était déjà inscrit dans notre manifeste. C'était la phase de la lutte pour la récupération de notre patrimoine. C'est ainsi que nous avons entamé ce que nous nous qualifions la diplomatie active, qui est cette façon d'agir pour récupérer ce qui nous a été volé et pris, sans demander au voleur l'autorisation et la permission. En outre, nous avons mis en place un front multiculturel qui rassemble notamment le peuple, les tribus, les clans, les organisations, et de toutes ces nations qui ont été dépossédées et déshéritées de leur patrimoine. C'est le fonds multiculturel anti-spoliation. So to you, I, based on the responses that we've got so far, would you say that much of the debate about the restitution of African artifacts, treasures, heirlooms, has focused very much on the physical objects and their possible monetary value without much debate on what it actually means psychologically and culturally for African people. Yes, Ni, I, I would agree with you. And I think it's symptomatic of the fact that the debate around restitution um, is a little bit too dominated by voices from the North, from, from Europe in this regard. And, and it, it needs, of course, to be led from Africa. I mean, it's true, it's a historical process so that when the Ben and Bronzes were looted, when they arrived in Europe or any other objects, it, in a sense, they came under a cold European gaze, their meaning changed. They became objects of art uh, to Europeans uh, who weren't aware of the spiritual or, or religious value which they might have had before. In relation to your, to your previous question, yes, I mean, I, I absolutely agree that the colonial process involved the destruction or the degeneration of African belief systems and African societies. That was much bigger than just the looting of objects, the colonial project. And I, I sometimes worry that we're putting a little bit too much weight on these objects and their return. And maybe we're, we're pinning our, our hopes a little bit too high. But having said that, um, if you go to Benin City, which is the place I know best in, in this regard, you're right. There is, there is a palpable feeling uh, that a culture was amputated uh, a city today, which is at the centre uh, of uh, the illegal trade of of uh, women going to work in the sex trade in Europe and all sorts of other uh, demeaning things, and and a great hope that if uh, people can be reunited with their culture, uh, somehow a society will, I guess you know, get back its its moral bearings. But putting a lot of weight on these objects, I feel. I think very interesting points. There might be the argument that there's a lot of weight placed on, on the objects, but the objects are also symbolic. So if the culture is to be reconstituted, which is 
almost impossible to do because cultures evolve. So effectively what happens is that the evolution of a culture is interrupted. Sometimes it's the physical things that give the idea that something can be salvaged because you can see those tangible objects. I wonder if maybe the Abanza or um, Fatumata might have a response to that. I will come back to uh, a statement that the African Museum after Guazul Diabanza was charged for stealing from them and um, just to kind of look at the perspective that sometimes Europe has in regards to these things. So if I can say something is that I agree that uh, the original people uh, people from villages uh, were kind of uh, disregarded uh, in this uh, in this debate, uh, which was much more political and diplomatic than uh, cultural and, uh, and memorial. And it is really interesting you are saying that because when I was writing my novel, I asked myself, where should the totem go back? Uh, should it go back in a museum in Dakar or should it uh, go back in its original place? at the village and uh, the answer were kind of obvious to me, decided as a writer, as a creator to bring back the, the totem uh, in the village because the village was kind of craving for, for the totem uh, that was a, a protector in terms of harvesting, in terms of uh, global happiness in the village. So um, the totem was needed much more in a village than in a museum as we know, uh, in a Western uh, way of saying or of doing a scenographic uh, muse uh, museum. Yeah, so something which is Dia Banza is doing is really important by saying that, by entering into the museum and saying, I need to take it, this back into uh, the original places uh, in Africa. So, yeah, so I think definitely the the people, the villagers, should be much more involved in the uh, discussions, in the debate. Uh, un peu la, la vie, dans le sens où, uh, pour nous, d'ailleurs, dans le fond multiculturel anti-spoliation, nous l'avons bien spécifié, c'était d'ailleurs l'objectif. La question est à la fois politique, de vraies décisions qui permettront notamment de réhabiliter ceux qui ont été dépossédés de leur patrimoine. Uh, elle est aussi culturelle parce qu'il faut rassembler, il faut rassembler notamment les grands peuples, les clans, les tribus, les nations, autour notamment de cette question de la restitution. De cette question de la restitution, parce que euh, je crois encore que le monde peut retrouver son équilibre si justement nous reposons nous tous sur un socle de coopération multilatérale et bilatérale où l'identité de tout un chacun sera reconnue et respectée. Quant à ce qu'il en est, euh, le processus de restitution. Euh, nous, nous avons essayé de catégoriser cela en cinq euh, brièvement. Il y a des œuvres qui sont considérées comme des œuvres de première euh, importance, de premier ordre. Ces œuvres-là doivent être restituées notamment euh, aux familles, euh, aux clans, aux dynasties royales. Il y a de, 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 des œuvres qui sont euh, catégorisées comme des œuvres de deuxième euh, catégorie qui, justement, vont répartir dans des lieux et de places publiques, notamment euh, quand vous évoquez la question de village, des lieux D'où sont partis notamment euh, la plupart de ces œuvres-là qui ont été pillées. Il y a une troisième catégorie des œuvres qui doivent réintégrer les écoles de formation, ou si j'ose dire, les écoles initiatiques africaines, pour permettre notamment de faire revivre et de faire partager à la nouvelle génération cette mémoire, une partie de notre mémoire qui a été euh, justement arrachée. Et il y a euh, une quatrième catégorie qui justement euh, seront euh, aux mains des États c'est-à-dire des œuvres qui peuvent être exposées euh, pour que l'on puisse euh, notamment amorcer le processus de la réintégration de ces œuvres-là. Ça peut être aux mains des États euh, qui peuvent trouver des voies et moyens pour le mettre à disposition euh, de différents publics. Et enfin, il y a des œuvres qui continueront à circuler. En soi, nous ne sommes pas contre la circulation des œuvres, mais qui ne peuvent circuler qu'à condition. D'abord qu'il y ait restitution et qu'il y ait euh, notamment euh, un accord préalable de, de vrais et des authentiques propriétés. Donc euh, voilà à notre humble avis ce que nous estimons être pour nous, disons la perception qu'on a de cette question euh, de restitution à différentes phases. Ok, thanks everyone. Barnaby, you said that there's almost too much pressure on the objects, which on one level is true. But if anyone has ever 
put together a jigsaw puzzle. Even if you're missing pieces, once you get a few pieces together, you start to get a sense of the picture. So I feel that while the argument is valid, is that also the kind of argument that governments and museums might use as an excuse to be the last to return things because they'll say, well, it's not the most important thing. If the culture is restored, then we'll restore the objects. But actually the objects can help to restore the full picture because when the objects come, they're like the pieces in the jigsaw puzzle, which then help people to put things together or even to remember because there's a way in which when people interact with objects, memory can come back because sometimes things have been passed down in the oral sphere. What would be your position on that? Sure, I, I would agree with you. Uh, it absolutely can and is used as an excuse by people who don't want to give these objects back. But I would also say that this debate about the value of objects is also occurring in African societies. I mean, I, I've met many people, sorry if I keep on alluding to Nigeria and, and, and Fatumata, or Diabanza can talk with greater authority about Senegal or, or Congo or elsewhere. But I've met many people in Nigeria, including even in Benin City, who say, look, you know, we want jobs, we want roads, uh, we, we, we want better primary schools, all, all the rest of it. So, it, it, you know, though that debate is happening in Africa as well, uh, and, and, and it needs to be addressed at that side too. What's interesting about these debates is that they always seem to be positioned as though these two things can't happen side by side, as though one has to happen before the other. But actually, they can all happen side by side. I mean, a state is not run by one actor. And it's not also, you don't have to have roads in order to have your objects returned to you, especially if we're following the argument of Mazulu Diavanza in saying that the objects don't necessarily have to go to, the objects that don't need to go to a museum, they need to go to families, etc. Yeah, no need. I mean, I, I agree that of course there's no reason why these should be mutually exclusive goals. I'm just saying that you, you do hear these discussions a lot um, in Africa as well as in, in Europe. Uh, yes, I think you are absolutely right, uh, Barnaby, in uh, uh, pointing out all these infrastructural uh, issues that are now uh, met in Africa. And I think it's a more of a prioritization, not prioritization, but a kind of how to put in place, I think, and now I will just show my policy analysis uh, hat. Uh, I think the question is how to do a programmatic uh, strategy, not to uh, consider culture against uh, food, for example, or against roads. I think it will be more a question of uh, how to put in place uh, inclusive policies so that uh, what we want is um, the African art to be universal, not only in, in, uh, in big Western museum, but in Africa, how to make African art universal. And I think there are some like pre-existing conditions African countries and authorities and policymakers should follow so that their countries can be uh, economically, touristically, and also environmentally attractive. Uh, I think cities uh, must be sustainable, provide uh, sustainable jobs, uh, the air must be clean so that African will have enough mental space to go to museums and also so that um, international tourists can just deviate their holiday um, trajectory and come in Africa to visit museums and cities and so on. So yeah, so I think it, it, does, it leads us to um, kind of an intersection of that we need inclusive policy making uh, in Africa, not only cultural, but also uh, economically speaking, so that the continent can be can um, raise um, its head um, and provide uh, sustainable living standards to all. Mazulu, I'm going to come to you, and essentially, I, I think it's really interesting that we we talk about the lack of infrastructure, etc., and forget that. What, what's happened is we've transitioned from fully functioning kingdoms into barely functioning nations that were set up by Europeans. 
and that never becomes part of the debate that actually that debate is also part of the theft um and i i'm also i'm particularly interested in this way that the debate is always framed as though europeans should have a say in how things are done so after the africa museum and the court case the africa museum i I made a statement in which they said that they understand the motives of the activists, which in, which basically was um, Mazulu Diabanza and his organization, but disapproves of the way in which they made their statement. And so this, for me, is a is a reflection of what happens in the debate and in the kind of cause for restitution that constantly we're being told by Europeans how we should protest, how we should get restitution of what belongs to us, and what the Abanza's response be to that. Uh, je pense que les questions et les problèmes sont très mal posés. Les problèmes, uh, quand elles sont posées comme ça, hmm. nous sommes en train de continuer dans un train, uh, dans une volonté politique qui a été définie uh, loin des sphères uh, africaines, loin de la participation des Africains, loin même de la volonté des Africains. Lorsqu'on pose, par exemple, le problème des infrastructures et autres, la vie qui intéresse aujourd'hui les Africains, les Africains s'intéressent à cette vie parce que c'est la seule qui leur a été proposée. C'est la seule qui leur a été donnée. Ils ont sûrement détruit le chemin qui devait prendre l'Afrique pour les imposer à devenir des consommateurs et des idées et de modèles et, euh, si vous voulez, euh, des types euh, de construction même à avoir. Parlons d'abord de la question de euh, les deux questions qui ont été euh, débattues avant de la reconstruction de la culture et de la restitution. Euh, la reconstruction de la culture est d'ailleurs le point central avant qu'on en arrive à la restitution. Cette reconstruction rentre dans le cadre de ce que nous nous appelons d'abord les réparations. C'est la condition sine qua non. Dans la réparation, il y aura cette phase de la reconstruction. Dans cette phase de la reconstruction, on commence par la réhabilitation de la vérité historique. Les nations européennes et occidentales doivent dire exactement ce qui s'est passé, ce qu'ils ont fait réellement à l'Afrique pendant cette période ô combien sombre. Après cette période, cette phase de la réhabilitation de la vérité historique, il y a maintenant la phase euh, justement de la réparation qui rentre aussi euh, la réparation financière. Donc, il faut euh, restituer aux pays et aux nations africaines, aux États, aux peuples africains, mais aussi le peuple d'Australie, d'Océanie et tous les autres d'Asie, d'Amérique qui ont été dépossédés de leur patrimoine, leur réverser toute la manne financière qui a été amassée pendant cette période d'exhibition, d'exploitation, de vente illicite de leur patrimoine. C'est ce qui va faire renaître à l'Africain, si vous voulez, l'intérêt vis-à-vis de cette culture ou de ces passés. Il faut susciter l'intérêt. Et pour ressusciter l'intérêt, comme je le disais, il faut réparer les mémoires, reconstruire les mémoires. Ce n'est qu'à la fin qu'il y aura notamment cette phase des restitutions qui commence aussi par la restitution, non seulement des œuvres d'art telles qu'elles sont là, des pièces euh, concrètement, mais aussi des récits qui vont avec, des bandes sonores qui ont été euh, enregistrés dans des conditions dont on le sait, qui ont été pillés, euh, c'est-à-dire en, en, en un mot, tout ce qui est comme archive doit aussi être restitué. Ce n'est qu'en ce moment-là, lorsque cette mémoire de l'Africain reviendra, d'abord l'homme et la femme africaine seront reconstruites. Avant de reconstruire l'Afrique, c'est cet homme et cette femme qui, sera, euh, qui seront reconstruites. Après, il faut qu'il y ait une reconstruction de nos relations bilatéral et multilatéral avec l'Occident. Il faut que les mémoires soient réconciliées. Il faut que les plaies soient pensées. On ne peut pas continuer comme ça, faisant abstraction à cette douleur qui est en nous et à cette partie de notre histoire, de notre mémoire qui a été étouffée. Donc voilà la, la, la phase d'abord qui précède. C'est la reconstruction de l'homme, la reconstruction de nos relations qui aura comme conséquence la reconstruction culturelle de l'Afrique. Ce n'est que par la reconstruction culturelle de l'Afrique que l'Afrique, de manière générale, sera reconstruite parce que l'Afrique a été détruite sur le plan politique, sur le plan économique, sur tout le plan. Et la reconstruction de l'Afrique commence d'abord par la reconstruction culturelle pour que l'homme et la femme africaine retrouvent, le, euh, si vous voulez, 
euh, la colonne vertébrale qui leur permettra d'être debout et de redresser leur front. C'est qu'en ce moment-là qu'on pourra maintenant parler des questions des infrastructures, de la mise en place des politiques qui a été évoquée par Fatoumata, des politiques et des stratégies mises en place. Je pense que dans notre traité du Front multiculturel anti-spoliation, nous avons parlé notamment de ces mécanismes et de ces politiques qui doivent être mises en place pour justement euh, susciter l'intérêt maintenant euh, aux autres de venir vers l'Afrique pour euh, voir ce qu'ils veulent voir ou euh, permettre notamment à l'Afrique aussi de bénéficier euh, de ce qui leur a été dépossédé pendant deux temps. Parmi ces stratégies, c'est là où j'évoquais euh, les différentes étapes de la restitution, mais aussi la construction d'une autoroute culturelle qui permettra notamment à la circulation libre patrimoine culturel ou des œuvres d'art qui ont été pillées. Mais ce que nous allons refuser, c'est de refaire l'erreur monumentale commise par l'Occident, cette erreur qui consiste euh, à, si vous voulez, à, à renfermer des énergies, à renfermer des énergies comme dans des musées, à mettre euh, à tout vu même des œuvres qui ne sont pas censées être mises à la disposition de tous les yeux, c'est-à-dire de bafouer l'intimité de la plupart des œuvres dont, qui ont vu leurs intimités bafouées, violées, euh, dans la manière dont elles sont exposées dans des musées européens. Ça, nous allons refuser ça et nous y veillerons. Voilà pourquoi ces stratégies et ces politiques seront mises en place une fois qu'elle a reconstruction opérée. Uh, so I think uh, Diabanza's uh, point on uh, financial reparation is a very important one in the debate, um, if not the main one actually, because what is stake is what is at stake um, really is uh, to go um, is beyond uh, what has been taken. It's more a political economy issue. Uh, so. It's um, how to compensate the losers and how to also to create new winners. Uh, so in addition to bringing the physical object uh, back, uh, financial uh, compensation would uh, definitely uh, repair financially the damage and provide countries with a capital that they can inject in their economy, in the economy of African arts. Uh, and also would also uh, compensate the families and also communities that has been uh, looted. So, yes, I really think that financial reparation is very uh, important. And also there was um, uh, um, uh, a topic that had been raised and I would like to provide some uh, more details on that. It's kind of a socialization of objects in areas that are external to conventional museums that we know them today. Uh, in Dakar, for example, we have this very important and uh, uh, technically sound uh, museum, the Musée de Civilisation Noire, headed by uh, the professor Ramadi Bokum, which is really a great museum that has nothing to envy to the biggest museum in the world, but also, um, We can also consider what uh, are like alternative museums where objects can be re-socialized in a kind of a scenario which is more social and more uh, fidel uh, to what the original people, what the original villages um, did at the time before the object were uh, were stolen. So this also the personal socialization of object is also a very important um, angle of analysis. I agree with what's been said. And I think this maybe is, is one of the great challenges for Africa at the moment is how to define a new kind of museum uh, that is not cast in some European or, or colonial model. I mean, in Lagos, next year in, in uh, 2022, uh, there's potentially a very exciting project, the John Randall uh, Museum of Yor Yoruba Culture, which is opening over the road from the National Museum, right in the heart of the city. Uh, and can, can the designers and the architects of that build a museum that is alive and that speaks to people's culture? Because if you go over the road, to the National Museum, which was a museum uh, built in, in colonial times, um, it, it's, it's, in a, it's a sad state. And I, I think it's probably symptomatic of, of many African capitals. The majority of people who go to it are school children on compulsory 
uh, visits. Uh, and in fact, there are. It has a superb collection of Benin bronzes, but people don't go and see it. The, 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 the museum is, is slowly withering and dying. But what one thing I perhaps would say to, to dear Banza and, and maybe, maybe to all of you is that I do feel that the world is, is changing quite fast. I mean, the, the debates are happening which weren't happening four or five years ago. And so, for example, with the Benin Bronzes, if you talk to the people who are trying to set up the new museum in Benin City, and there are already splits between the governor and the Oba there, which is, which is a problem, but uh, th th they'll tell you, look, we don't have a shortage of European museums that want to give us back our Benin Bronzes. Uh, there are plenty who are, you know, I'm paraphrasing, but effectively queuing up uh, and so this means that Nigerian politicians, state governors, traditional rulers, the Oba, they have an enormous, more, much more power in this process than they've ever had before since, since the moment uh, at which these, these objects were looted. Uh, the, the governor of Edo State, the Oba of Benin, they will be major players in what happens to the Benin bronzes. And we could not have said that. 10 or 20 or 30 years ago. And I think there probably are parallels with Senegal or Cote d'Ivoire. And that, that's a good thing. And it shows how the world has changed. We, we wouldn't even have said it five years ago. So, I mean, I think it's, it, these are all good and interesting points. The demise of the National Museum in Nigeria, for instance, for me, might be um, symptomatic of the fact that the way in which the objects are displayed is not the way that we would the continent on the continent would relate to objects. I mean, in some of these museums, you see objects like baskets, which we would use and reuse or, or repair and throw away, being kept for decades. And I think the willingness of these museums to give things back is, again, because they're returning something to a paradigm which they recognize the frame of the museum, that it's being returned to a museum. But actually, and I think this is partly um, the Abanza's argument, the return should not just be around the idea of museums, because actually some of these objects were just household objects. Some of these objects were very personal objects to families. Some of these objects, yes, were on public display, like the bronzes at the Obers Palace, um, where to show you know, wealth and for people to see and be impressed but a lot of the objects are also personal objects. So the way in which they're displayed might be the reason why African audiences, African children, African families are not engaging with them. Um, and so I, th I think that's really interesting. And, and I think it comes down to another thing which the Abanza has touched on, which is, you know, th there are entire careers and, and, and wealth that have been built on these objects, your ethnographers and anthropologists who've been experts on Africa and lectured for years, um, often teaching people to frame Africa as inferior, um, as, as civilizations in progress, approaching um, somewhere close to European civilization in, in good time, or, well, I mean, this is what we found and we've given them something better, that kind of thing. Um, and I think the reason why the debates are constantly um, buttressed or I wouldn't say buttressed, sort of we, you have voices from the side from Europe saying, well, you need to do this, you need to do this, is because of the framing of African intellect and oral history and the authority of that as inferior. So it's really interesting that this, this debate happens and we're not seeing that the, the reason why the museums are willing to return these things is because it, in, a, in a way, it's returning them on their terms, not on the terms or needs of Africans. Um, of, I'm going to give the Abanza um, uh, a chance to respond to everything that's been said, and then maybe we'll, we'll see about wrapping this up. I think um, we're all agreed that the treasure should return. What we are not agreed about, agreed on is the how, the whens, the whys. C'est la raison pourquoi, dans le traité des restitutions que nous avons euh, justement publié des 13 articles euh, autour du Fonds multiculturel anti-spoliation, nous parlons justement dans l'autoroute culturelle que nous voulons construire pour la circulation ou la libre circulation des œuvres d'art, nous parlons de cette façon d'exposer les œuvres d'art africaines, 
déjà dans des musées européens, il aurait fallu qu'à chaque fois qu'on expose une œuvre venue du Bénin, par exemple, qu'il qu soit écrit en fond. En fond, oui, comme si on a écrit en anglais, on peut l'écrire dans la langue d'origine et avoir une expression ou une compréhension de ce qu'on est, de vrai gardien, de ce qui en sont les vrais gardiens, notamment de l'œuvre en question. Euh, il y a aussi euh, cette possibilité de le faire pour chacune des œuvres. D'ailleurs, euh, c'est ce que nous recommandons. Dans les jours à venir, s'il faudra exposer des œuvres d'art en Occident ou euh, ailleurs, mais après euh, une, un libre consentement entre les deux parties, il faudrait que les langues africaines soient prises en compte. Il y a notamment cette question que j'évoquais euh, de l'exhibition à tout vu, parce qu'il y a des œuvres d'art qui ne peuvent pas être mises à la disposition de tout le monde, qui doivent être gardées pour certaines personnes ayant fourni un effort supplémentaire ou ayant été préparé d'être en connexion ou en contact avec ces énergies. Donc, c'est la logique pourquoi nous, nous avons choisi d'aller vers la diplomatie active pour répondre euh, à ces autres suggestions ou préoccupations. Nous avions choisi notamment d'aller vers la diplomatie active parce que la diplomatie active est cette façon-là d'agir qui consiste à placer la dignité humaine et euh, si l'on veut la culture africaine au-dessus de toute exigence. Ces exigences peuvent être protocolaires, peuvent être sécuritaires, peuvent être juridico-judiciaires, mais ce sont des exigences vues par l'Occident et pour les intérêts des Occidentaux. Ce ne sont pas des exigences africaines. Donc moi, je conçois mal que j'aille euh, auprès des autorités françaises pour réclamer la restitution, par exemple, de la pièce euh, qui représente le dieu euh, Ogun Ogu Ferai venu du Bénin. D'ailleurs, parmi les 26 œuvres que les Français veulent restituer euh, au gouvernement béninois, il y a deux œuvres qui manquent. Et parmi les deux œuvres, il y a cette pièce maîtresse qui constitue d'ailleurs, qui cristallise la question de la restitution pour le, euh, laquelle le gouvernement béninois réclame la restitution de tout ce qui a été pillé dans le palais d'Abomé. Il y a euh, les œuvres comme Nekuko en République démocratique du Congo qui a été pillé notamment dans les villages de Kikuku à Boma. Donc, on voit aisément que le calendrier est défini par l'Occident, la manière et quand est définie par l'Occident. Or, dans cette question de restitution, il y a une question de dignité. Il y a une question d'honneur pour le peuple qui a été humilié, dont euh, les patrimoines ont été confisqués. Donc, il ne faut pas que les gouvernements européens et occidentaux puissent avoir le monopole de l'initiative. C'est pourquoi nous avons décidé, nous, d'agir dans ce sens, justement pour répondre à l'initiative, l'esprit de l'initiative, et, et fixer, nous, les conditions euh, à travers les négociations, s'il y aura, doivent se passer, les conditions et les calendriers des restitutions et de la manière dont ça doit être restitué. Il y a une manière pour euh, améliorer ce qui nous a été volé. Qu'est-ce que nous, les Africains, ont fait avant de récupérer cette période voilà les fondamentales qui se posent, qui sont des questions pour lesquelles il faut la raison pourquoi nous avons donné de ne pas demander l'autorisation et la permission à un voleur pour récupérer ce qu'il a volé. Parce que quoi qu'il en soit, quoi que l'on dise, ce sont des voleurs et des pilleurs qui ont arraché ces œuvres-là pour les amener chez eux. Et un propriétaire ne demande pas à un voleur la de récupérer le droit. What appears to be evident to me, or what's evident to me, is that we might be having this discussion about taking back the stolen treasures because the one thing that is actually the first thing that should be given back to Africans in order for this to progress is their dignity, which it would appear Europe and the West are not prepared to give back fully to African people. Because if that dignity was restored, then the debate would not be, how are you going to look after the objects or where are you going to put the objects? Because in restoring someone's dignity, you also restore their autonomy, which means that whatever they decide is to be done with objects that actually belong to them, they'll be able to do and nobody will, be, will debate with them. So without the willingness to restore the full dignity of African people, whether it's former kingdoms, whether it's new countries that were carved out of European treaties, that has to be the first step. That would appear to be the argument that Mazulu Banza is making, and I agree with him. If there are any responses to that, I'm happy, very, very happy to hear them. 
and then we will bring this to a close. À tous les pour en arriver à la restitution des pas qui est ouvert. Je disais, c'est juste un appel lancé à toute vive euh, africaine, à toute la diaspora africaine de partout des quais, justement dans ces combats pour la restitution euh, de notre patrimoine, parce qu'il en va de soi pour la construction de cette dignité et la reconstruction euh, tant soit peu par euh, différentes euh, formes. C'est un combat aussi puisse notamment euh, purger euh, leur mémoire après tous ces siècles d'innominés des mensonges, eux qui ont porté le lourd fardeau de certains criminels qui ont tout fait en leur nom. Donc voilà pour nous euh, c'est qu'en est euh, l'important dans ces combats afin que euh, euh, les mémoires soient réconciliées et que nous puissions tous euh, aller vers le sens d'une coopération bilatérale et multilatérale où l'identité de tout un chacun sera reconnue et respectée. Yeah, so just to, to, to summarize, I, I would say that uh, the restitution of uh, African uh, looted artifacts and totems are really needed uh, right now and uh, for a continent that is rebuilding and, uh, and healing from, uh, and I'm not uh, exaggerating, from centuries of darkness. So I think that, yes, uh, as Adia Banza uh, said it very well, it is kind of a restoration of African man's dignity. And also, um, I would add uh, from the restoration of uh, cultural economy and also the, the largest economy of, of Africa. So, yes, I think that uh, now is the time that Africa take back uh, its uh, treasures, really confident that uh, strategies and willingness that all parties parties, Africa and also Western, uh, the, the Western world will come up with a kind of um, a middle uh, agreement on the restitution. Well, I would just say these debates are very necessary. How do we ensure that if objects are returned to Africa, it's done in such a way that realizes uh, the great hopes around this process? Should these objects go to museums or not? We, we, we need to have a debate on that. If they are going to go to museums, and sometimes it feels as if it's an African elite which has co-opted this debate and they are going to go straight to museums, how do we ensure that there are living museums? Uh, and I see encouraging signs in that regard. If you talk to someone like Sir David Ajay with his vision of a museum in Benin City, although it is not the Obba's vision, so there's a difference there, but Sir David Ajay talks about, you know, it, what we cannot do is just put objects in glass vitrines and, and that, that museum will just die. If you talk to someone like uh, Shion Odowole for his vision of a, a Yoruba new museum in the middle of Lagos, I think people, African intellectuals on the continent, are very, very cognizant of these pitfalls. Thank you very much to everyone that's been with us in this session, Taking Back Africa Stolen Treasures. With me, Ni Aikwe Parks, have been Fatima Ngom, who is the author of Les Silences du Totem, Moazul Diabanza, who leads an organization which is focused on the restitution of African artifacts and heritage objects. We hope that this has been interesting and that you will, in your own ways, join the debate, start to talk about how we reclaim our connection with these objects that were stolen from us. That five minutes madness only you can understand. Visit myspectre.com to get your Spectre experience. Spectre. Loans in five minutes.